All right, it looks like we're right at 2.01 and we're really excited to get started. Welcome to everyone who is joining us today for this webinar about the Citizens Institute on Rural Design and the opportunity to respond to our request for applications. We see a lot of folks still signing on, but good news is this webinar will be recorded, so you can certainly refer back to it. All right, well, let me kick us off. My name is Jen Hughes. I'm the Director of Design and Creative Placemaking at the National Endowment for the Arts. And I'm really excited to welcome you all to this webinar today so that we can um, share with you details about the Citizens Institute on Rural Design program. So just to give you a little bit of context, uh, first off, the Citizens Institute on Rural Design is a leadership initiative of the National Endowment for the Arts in partnership with the Housing Assistance Council with design expertise from To Be Done Studio. Focusing on communities with populations of 50,000 or less, CARD's goal is to enhance the quality of life and economic viability of rural America through planning, design, and creative placemaking. So we wanted to kick off the conversation today with just some introductions to the organizations that are in partnership in executing the Citizens Institute on Rural Design program. First and foremost, introducing you to the National Endowment for the Arts, which is an independent federal agency whose funding and support gives Americans the opportunity to participate in the arts, exercise their imaginations, and develop their creative capacities. In short, the National Endowment for the Arts is a federal agency that receives annual appropriation from Congress, and we execute our mission through grant making, managing a range of leadership initiatives with partners such as CIRD, conducting research on the impact of the arts and more. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about the National Endowment for the Arts, you should check out arts.gov. One of our exceptional partners is the Housing Assistance Council, which is a national nonprofit that strengthens communities across rural America through assistance with affordable housing and community development. And they've proven to be an extraordinary partner in this program, and we're so pleased to be working with them again uh, on this round to lead the program. In addition, um, CIRD benefits from the design expertise of To Be Done Studio. To Be Done Studio harnesses the power of design to create sustainable solutions to the endemic problems that our world faces. To do so, they design and build spaces that uplift, inspire, and support power within the communities we work. And you'll be hearing from each of our partners as we proceed in this presentation. But let's begin a little bit with an overview about the program, just a little bit of background and history. Uh, established in 1991 by the National Endowment for the Arts, the Citizens Institute on Rural Design has supported more than 100 communities in all regions of the country, empowering residents to leverage local assets for the future in order to build better places to live, work, and play. So this program focuses on communities with populations of 50,000 or less, and CRD's goal is to enhance the quality of life and economic viability of rural America through planning, design, and creative placemaking. So some details about the program goals. Uh, what is the Citizens Institute on Rural Design all about? It's really intended to empower local citizens to capitalize on unique local and regional assets. We know in rural communities all across the country, there are incredible assets that we really hope to emphasize through design, planning, and creative placemaking. So first and foremost, the program's focused on building design capacity in rural communities to plan comprehensive revitalization strategies, to introduce creative placemaking, arts, culture, and design strategies as drivers of economic development in rural America. Where the program's also very focused on facilitating a network of rural communities for design ideas, exchanges, and peer learning. We know that there are brilliant ideas and approaches that you all have been leading in your rural community, and we want to really facilitate that type of exchange. And lastly, the program is also intended to prepare communities to be ready and competitive for arts and design related uh, state and federal funding opportunities. So you'll hear a bit more about some of the specifics of the types of design challenges um, that 
the Citizens Institute on Rural Design is intended to address. Um, but just to give you a little bit of a sense for those types of uh, topics that we welcome into the, the program, could be the historic adaptive reuse of community buildings, designing quality affordable housing that supports livability, creating public spaces that integrate local identity and creative and active recreation, developing recreational trails for mobility, redesigning Main Street, designing spaces that improve access to local food systems, integrating culture in your town to drive heritage tourism. We really have been focused on supporting a wide range of design and arts and cultural issues in rural America um, through the Citizens Institute on Rural Design program. So I'm going to turn this over to my colleagues to really get into some of the specifics about how to apply, uh, what that really looks like, and the opportunity that we're offering here today. There are two distinct opportunities, hosting a local design workshop, or being part of a design learning cohort. So I am going to turn this over to Courtney Spearman, my colleague at the National Endowment for the Arts, uh, to share a little bit more about this opportunity today. Thank you, Jen. Uh, before we get into the specifics of the two opportunities, I uh, want to just walk quickly through the timeline for the application. Um, as many of you are probably aware, the applications are due March 12th. Um, we have today's webinar as a preparatory piece to help you understand a little more about the opportunity. We also are going to be offering some office hours on February. I think the date is actually the 17th now um, and March 1st. If you keep an eye on our Facebook page, um, the details of the time and date for those will be posted there. So you can check there or check on our website at rural-design.org um, to get a detail on those office hours and those will be um, low key opportunities to ask particular questions. And of course you can reach us just through uh, email as well at CIRD at rural dash at rural home dot org. Um, if you have questions, as we said, applications are due at midnight on March 12th. That's midnight Eastern time. And then we'll go through a review process internally um, with folks from the field to look at the applications and select uh, four workshop communities and up to 15 uh, learning uh, design learning cohort communities. Uh, we'll be in touch with folks um, after we've made those selections and be in touch uh, certainly with planning for those who are selected. And then we'll begin programming in May, May of 2021. So we're trying to move pretty quickly here to get things going. Um, and then from there, programming goes for about 18 months through the close to the end of 2022. Uh, in terms of who's eligible to apply, uh, as the name of the program indicates, we are focused on rural communities. Uh, for us, rural is 50,000 people or less, and I will emphasize the less there. Most of the communities that participate in the program are in you know, much smaller sizes. We occasionally have one or two in the 30s, but usually those communities, the communities that are participating are somewhere between 5,000 and 10,000 people and sometimes even smaller. Um, definitely uh, rural and rural in character, meaning not a small town outside of a big city, but rural in character and in, in proximity to urban environments. Um, you need to be able to have a specific design challenge in mind, a particular need that you are hoping to address. And hopefully this presentation will give you guys some ideas about what types of things we're looking for. Um, Jen mentioned a few. There's also some listed in our RFP and the RFA, um, some ideas of projects there. Um, you need to be able to participate in the CRD program as expected. That means um, engaging in activities if you're in the learning cohort uh, for the 18 months or so that the program runs. Um, there will be about uh, roughly monthly opportunities for that. Um, and then um, for the workshops, the hands on piece of it's a little more detailed, but we can talk more about that as um, Omar gets into the workshops piece. Um, and, you know, again, fully committing to being part of the program um, from May through December 22. Um, our hope, particularly with the cohort, but it applies really across all the program activities, is that there's a peer learning component here. And that's why that committing to the full period of programming is important. We want you all to connect to each other. Um, as well as um, hearing you know, from the folks that we're engaging to help uh, bring project ideas to fruition. Applicant organizations uh, are either municipal governments, tribal or county governments, so gov ent government entities can apply. 
local nonprofit organizations that would include Main Street organizations, art centers, preservation groups, historical societies, chambers of commerce, um, all different kinds of groups that are nonprofits. Um, regional planning groups are welcome to apply and university programs that are working in rural communities are also eligible to apply. In terms of selection, there's sort of two sets of criteria that we use to look at uh, these applications. One is excellence uh, and one is merit. And with the realm of excellence, we're looking for the commitment and capacity, particularly of the, commun of the community to participate. Are you on board? Are you, you and your community excited about this opportunity and involved? And um, do you have the right team assembled, the right folks assembled to carry out the activities if you're selected for a workshop um, or engage in um, the activities that we're offering through the cohort, which are all online, um, but to address those design challenges. Um, and then the merit piece of it folks mo focuses more on the relevance of the project you're bringing to the table. Um, is it important for your community to address this design challenge? How is that manifested? How is it decided that this is a need in the community? Um, and showing evidence of the community's readiness and interest in, in tackling the design challenge that you've presented, um, as well as um, engaging with folks in the local community to, um, to bring that project to fruition. All right, I'm going to hand it over to Omar now, and he will talk a little more about the design workshop opportunity. Sorry about that. OK, thank you, Courtney. Thanks, Jen and Evelyn. Um, excited to be on here with you all today. Um, the design workshops are basically set up to um, offer any type of design assistance to the applicant community. Um, we try to make it adaptable, flexible, such that um, if you have a specific need, we can respond to it as long as it is in the framework of design, planning, or creative placemaking. Um, Jen and Courtney talked about some of the um, potential types of projects. I would, I would suggest um, as you're applying to just as long as you're articulating the design need clearly, um, we can kind of evaluate it from there. Don't worry too much about if it's a farmer's market or a cafe project or a affordable housing initiative or kind of, you know, as long as you're articulating yourself clearly um, and what the design need and challenge is, I think we can evaluate it from there. Um, talking a little bit more about um, some of those examples, like we mentioned previously, historic preservation, adaptive reuse, quality affordable housing, creating public spaces um, that support local identity, um, recreation trails, Main Street um, design elements that support economic activity, um, access to local food systems, and in integrating culture through heritage tourism. Um, but those again are just a few examples. We can go wider than that. Um, one thing to keep in mind as we go through the process with you all, should you be selected, is that we are kind of working on the front end of the process. We don't have the capacity to kind of go all the way soup to nuts and do a um, full affordable housing design through construction documents. This is a what we call a schematic design process where we're starting in the initial stages and are able to help um, get ideas on and I'll show you some on paper and I'll show you some examples of that later on. Um, a little bit about the process of the workshop. Um, what we what we'll, we'll try to do with everyone is first set the scope like what is it that we need to um, that we're going to work on together. Um, through from there, we'll we'll create an engagement plan, which basically is a plan that lays out how engagement um, with the stakeholders of the project and I and and normally some form of public element, although that's somewhat challenged during COVID. Um, what what that plan would look like? Who are we reaching out to? How do we do that either virtually or um, in a safe way? and and kind of come up with a plan for that. Ideally, um, more 
or someone else from the design team would come into a site visit or we set up a virtual site visit. Um, but we do like to kind of understand what the context of the place is and really kind of get into that. Um, we'll then schedule a kickoff meeting, which will be about how to, um, which will really kind of get us moving. We'll set up planning, a planning meeting or planning meetings. That will then lead us into a public meeting, which will be part of the engagement plan as we talked about how we do that public engagement we're flexible on. Um, we try and create a period of feedback so we can gather feedback from um, local stakeholders, you know, anyone that we include in our engagement plan. Then we'll really dive in and get into the design workshop via a charrette, which is basically an intense quick period of design or a series of sessions or however we were, we're, again that's part of our scope setting in our engagement plan we'll design that together um, again some take some time to get some feedback and then we'll wrap that up and package that into a document that you can all that you all can use to take to the next step um, just as an example this is a community we work with um, in the last cycle of CIRD which was in Athens, Ohio, and they're converting their um, a former church building into a hub for black history and culture. And so we walked through some of the phases for that, what the programming was and what some of those spaces might look like, how to kind of lay that out and how to think about the space um, as it grows. Um, I can go into this a little bit, the design workshop. Um, you know, we set up a stipend for the community to host it. Like um, we, we try to right now tailor a virtual design process. Again, we're assuming that we're gonna be working mostly virtually. Um, we'd love for that to change, but that's the assumption we're going working under right now. Um, we, as we talked about, the, there's be a, a local uh, a site visit. Um, we're also, we'll also be hopefully work connecting you all with local designers. Um, or planners to help local, um, you know, folks move things along after the CIRD process wraps up. And um, yeah, and there'll be additional ongoing technical assistance kind of throughout the cycle. So if you work with us in the beginning of the workshop cycle and we're, let's say this fall, really working on a design process and then time goes on and you have questions the next summer so that would be summer 2022 you can call on us to kind of help update or adapt or brainstorm on next steps so we try and be accessible to you all um, throughout the process and i can hand this off Thanks, Omar. Um, yeah, so my name is Evelyn Eminen, and I am the project coordinator for the Citizens Institute on Rural Design here at the Housing Assistance Council. And I'd like to talk to you a little bit about our second opportunity, which is the design learning cohort. So um, Omar talked about an opportunity where there will be four communities selected for um, the design workshop. They'll receive a stipend, um, but up to 15 additional rural communities will be selected to participate in a design learning cohort. Um, and this is a way that we design to bring in more rural communities into our network. We love to be able to work with everyone that applies. Um, and uh, these are for communities that, you know, maybe you're not ready for the full scope of the design process, but design learning cohort members will be able to participate in virtual trainings and sessions on design, planning, and community engagement. Um, the program is designed to connect them with other peers and be able to exchange design ideas. Um, but this is not just uh, being talked at, this is actually engaging with each other and, and problem solving together. Um, uh, peers will also receive technical assistance. Uh, directly from experienced design professionals. So we want to be, as a national and federal program, we want to be able to bring that um, professionalism to rural communities that might not often get that exposure um, and work with you there. And then we are, our goal is specifically to provide support in navigating other funding opportunities. So this program is free and there's no 
travel required, but hopefully um, uh, we can connect you with additional funding throughout the two years that we're working with you. So if you are interested in being part of the design learning cohort, um, there's an opportunity in the application to select that you are only interested in the design learning cohort if you don't want to be part of the design workshop. Otherwise, um, there is one application for both programs. So you only have to fill out one application if you are interested in being considered for both. Now we have a video message. I don't want you to just have to take it from me. Last year, we launched the first um, design learning cohort and we have a video message from two of our partners so that you can hear from other rural communities about what they learned. I'm Lemuel Hancock, the urban designer and neighborhood planner for the town of Woodstock. Hi, I'm Kathleen Curtis, representing District 3 as a member of the Shenandoah County Planning Commission. The purpose for this was that individual communities could bring forward their needs or concerns or you know a project that they were hoping to get off the ground or were stuck on in one area or another and so in our peer group questioning that we were each to present each locale was to present you know uh, some ideas and then we were going to work on it as a group as far as where we thought they were in the process where they needed to go who they needed to contact next or you know that kind of thing collaborative to, sort of charrette design uh, talk out of that project, fancy word i didn't know talk what out was. a project yeah. um, and just bounce ideas off in kind of a relatively interesting space where you yeah. heard a lot of interesting ideas but then be able to talk to folks who may know Mm -hmm. a similar size locality, what you're kind of dealing with, or, you know, what have you done before that's worked well or hasn't mm -hmm. worked well, and what yeah. impediments might be there, or are you on the right track, and we're already seeing some of the important nature of what the conference was for, which was to create the collaboration and conversation yeah. within these rural communities, so that we're not starting over from scratch each time. Yeah. Or, or as I would say, not flailing around there all by ourselves, <laughs> you know. I think that was one of the benefits. I, you, you hate to say misery loves company, but in a way that was kind of what this was, you know, to let people know that, hey, you are not in this boat alone. That, you know, we're, we're in similar situations and here's some ways that have worked in some areas and here's some ways that we tried and it didn't work. So I really like that video because it shows um, two different participants from one community, Shenandoah County. Um, Kathleen on the left was not a designer. She was an economic development specialist. She really had no exposure to design thinking before this program, whereas Lemuel had more of that background, but they were able to work together. Um, and I think it really shows that, you know, you don't have to have any experience necessarily coming into the program. Um, and I think it's something they really enjoy. One note is that last year our program before coronavirus was able to take place during an in-person summit, um, which is now going to be transferred to a series of online learning this year. So what are the participation benefits if you decided that you want to be part of the design learning cohort? Um, there will be a series of online learning sessions led by experts tailored to engage co cohort members as I've been talking about, and I really do mean tailored. If there's something that you would like to see that pertains to your community, let us know in advance, and we have built in a lot of flexibility to be able to address your needs. Um, additionally, there's going to be a series of webinars um, that CERD will be doing for the public. So those of you who applied and weren't selected will still get access to our webinars, but the cohort members will have an exclusive breakout session afterwards with the presenters, which will be really fun. Um, additionally to that, they'll have technical assistance throughout the two years through office hours where they can meet with design experts and CERD staff. There'll be one on one coaching and there'll be an additional online resources um, and worksheets to help them with their design challenge. We also hope that one of the benefits of this is that it's a network of support from other rural peers um, uh, that you guys can find strength and inspiration from one another. Um, and we are also, again, emphasizing connecting you with funding opportunities through our networks. Um, so uh, there may be additional opportunities as health guidelines allow. Um, as conferences come up if uh, everything starts to open up again, but that is not guaranteed right now. So um, I hope we have a great online session prepared for you. 
Finally, uh, you may ask, how do I go about submitting your application? Um, so rural-design.org slash apply has everything that you need to know. Um, the first thing I would do is start by going through the request for applications document. At the very end of it, it has all of the questions that you'll be asked in the application form. Um, we, there is a word count on those applications, so I recommend that you look at this document and type up your responses ahead of time in case there's not a chance to save later. Um, there is also going to be a budget template that is downloadable from the site. Um, so that budget template will give you a sample of types of costs that you might want to consider. I'll describe some ineligible expenses and examples of in-kind expenses, as well as what the CERD team will be providing. So it's a completely flexible document. You can edit it um, as you see fit, as it works for your community. Um, as a tip, you might want to consider it, whether your design workshop will be in person or virtual. Um, these are the budget is also only for the design workshop opportunity. So anyone who's selected through the workshop will have an opportunity to resubmit your budget. It's not meant to be a final answer. We just want to get a sense for where um, you're thinking of uh, spending the dollars, but um, there will be a chance for a resubmission um, and we're welcome to answer any questions that you may have. Um, it's meant to be easy and usable and it has submission and it also has instructions at the bottom of how to submit the budget in your application in, in case you miss that information elsewhere. Also, when you go into your application, besides the questions, there will be a few opportunities for support supporting material. So you can submit photos such as uh, of your design site of a vacant site or a particular building that you'll be working on or some maps. You can also submit a video that um, explains the context of your community. Or you can submit letters of support from partners in your community. Um, so those are things to look at ahead of time and consider before you start your actu actual application document. Um, there's also details in the RFA and in the application about how to save your documents and upload them. Um, please save them under your community's name and the name of what the type of document it is so that it's easier for our panelists. And finally, in submitting your application, we encourage you, you know, even if you're considering this, we really do want this to be something that's accessible to all communities. We know some people are, sh are short on staff, so if you have any questions, please reach out to us. Um, we really want this to be an opportunity for you to show off the nature of your community and to talk about what you think you might be able to accomplish while working with CERD. All right, so I think that that is the end of the content of this webinar, but we are all, all our speakers are on board waiting to um, answer questions in the chat box. Um, and yeah, Evelyn, this is Courtney. Could I lift up a couple questions from the chat? There have been a few there that I think might be relevant for several folks. Yeah, definitely. Okay, great. So one question uh, that's been posed a couple different ways is whether applications can be submitted on behalf of more than one community, i.e. a county or a, a regional group. Um, I, the answer to that is yes. Obviously, the project needs to be relevant for multiple communities within the group. Um, but for example, the presentation in the video that we saw um, that Lemuel uh, presented on, uh, their project was actually focused on Shenandoah County, not just individual communities within the county. So um, if the project that you're submitting is relevant for a county, a group of communities within a county or within a region, then that's totally great. Um, there was also a question, Evelyn, you might know the answer to this. I couldn't remember. Do we allow applications from a state entity for um, like a Main Street project in a particular place? Um, that's a very good question, Courtney. Um, I think that we would allow that application, although I might recommend that um, that state entity serve as a partner or a facilitator. Um, so if it's possible to work with that community and for them to be the ones to submit that application um, and that community to show off their rural character, that might be a better way of presenting the design challenge to panelists. But I think that we would accept um, applications at the state level, so long as throughout their application they describe um, exactly the rural nature of the community that they're working in and what that design challenge is. Great. Thank you. 
Um, another question from the chat um, was around whether higher education institutions are eligible to apply on behalf of communities in their service area. Yes, uh, there does need to be evidence of partnership with that community, um, particularly when the applications are coming from an organization that may not be in the place, but part of it or nearby. Um, but yes, we can receive applications from universities on behalf of, of um, particular community projects. Um, let's see what else. Um, there's a question about whether a community with 50,299 people is uh, eligible. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if we're rounding up or down on these. Evelyn, do you and I don't know if you or Jen want to weigh in on that? Um, it's certainly on the high end of what we would consider. Yeah, um, we closer. I, I think that um, 50,000 is the cutoff that's stated. Um, it depends on if 50,000 is for a county and then the project takes place in a smaller community. Um, another way to tell whether or not your community is rural enough is to go to uh, the US Department of Agriculture. Um, they have their guidelines established pretty well that base it not just on population, but also on population density. So it's possible for, um, you know, a city, uh, a, a small town near a city to actually be less than $50,000, but for 50,000 uh, in population, but they are not a rural character in rural in character if they are um, associated with a certain population density. Um, so that is something that we could look more closely at um, to keep it simple. It's not typical for us to have a community of that size. That's great. Thank you. Um, one question that was submitted also in the chat around, um, I guess, partnerships or consultants. The question is, are local consultants part of the initial process and budget or are projects selected only uh, completed with CIRD staff or CIRD consultants? I would say our general idea is that the CIRD team would lead the workshop. If you have a local consultant that's already involved in your project or someone that you know the local community would want to hire uh, to help them manage their side of things, that would be welcome. We've certainly done projects like that um, in the past where there was sort of a local, and many of our projects do have sort of local uh, partners who are part of the team who are have some design expertise or, or uh, community engagement expertise or some other element that they're bringing to help uh, help the community in planning for the workshop. Um, so that's welcome, but I would say um, in general, CIRD would plan to bring the expertise needed to the project based on um, on you know what the scope of the project is. Uh, partners are welcome, and I, and I think even in the Athens, Ohio project that Omar talked about, there was a local partner who uh, was really doing a lot of the coordinating and um, planning from a design perspective and a historic preservation perspective um, on behalf of the community and, and with working with the community. Courtney, uh -huh. uh, I just wanted to add something to that. Um, yeah. Zomar Hakim with TBD. Um, so yes, in the scope setting process, we can figure out how we can collaborate with others and utilize um, you know, the maximum, get them the most out of the process for you all. Um, and so just wanted to throw that out there and then also just related to the to Courtney's response about the, you know, um, kind of conglomeration of communities or counties that would apply. Um, I would say that that's fine as well, agreeing with Courtney, but also keep in mind that we're going to be selecting basically one design challenge um, rather than let's say we have a county or a group of communities that's looking at affordable housing, transportation, and um, broadband access. Those are three different things, and one of them, the broadband access, is not as um, physical design oriented. It's more systems design oriented, so that one probably also wouldn't be as applicable. Thanks, Omar, and that actually addresses one of the questions that was in the chat about broadband. So that's great. Another question in the chat around cohort, uh, the cohort design groups, is there a one to one match required for that? No, there is not. There is no um, financial component to um, to the cohort. Basically, it's free for those who participate. 
Um, so there's no no money we give out to communities and no uh, money used as a match. The 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 investment from CERD is in the services and the the staff uh, piece, you know, the, the pieces of of um, technical assistance that we provide through that program. But there's no remunerative piece to it, unlike the workshops where there is actually a six thousand dollar stipend that is given to the community, um, and that that's where that one to one match comes in to show that they have. Um, an equal uh, financial investment uh, into the into the project. Um, again, that that investment can be made a lot of different ways. Staff time, um, and Evelyn's uh, mentioned the budget that's there as a sample. That's a great one to look at. But you know, volunteer time, lots of ways to meet that match. Um, but there's no match requirement and no money involved in um, the cohort opportunity. Let's see, lots of questions. Thanks, guys. Um, one more from uh, there's just a question about whether this webinar will be public. Uh, yes, we will be sending out. I think that I think we'll send out a link to anybody who registered and it will also be posted on the rural design website, so it'll be available there. Um, question about uh, private entities such as a construction or design firm appropriate to be part of the process. Absolutely, that goes back to that question about partnerships. Um, the expectation for the piece of the project that's that is um, within the scope of what CIRD is involved is that CIRD will be leading it, but you certainly can have uh, partners or engaged consultants who would amplify the work that's being led by CIRD um, in that in that type of project. Let's see. Courtney, I think the next one is about uh, rural planning organizations um, and if they can invite others once they've applied um, based on scoping and meeting eligibility requirements. I think that is an ex excellent example of a type of project that we've done in the past. Um, so the rural planning organization would be the uh, entity that applies and then um, uh, either if they have a specific design challenge that's in one community, they list that as a partner. If they're just applying to learn and engage um, or with a broader design challenge um, uh, based in their community, then they can invite other partners to be part of that process um, later down the road. That is absolutely what this is intended for. OK, yeah, I'm not sure I, that's I don't this question. Actually, I don't quite understand. So if Bert wants to um, clarify if that addressed his question. I, I was struggling a little bit in reading that one, trying to understand exactly what at what stage they would invite others to apply. So what we cannot do, it's not a regranting program. So if a rural organization applies, you can't then pass on the opportunity to somebody else. So in case that's what was behind your question, that's not eligible. Um, let's see what else. Let's see a question about county and city limits. We're zoned. We are a zoned rural community, very small within a much larger county, and our rural community location would be eligible. Yes, as long as um, you can define your community with some sort of name or boundary and population, that would be uh, eligible. I think key thing there to what Evelyn was saying earlier is that the um, organization or that the that the applicant and the project are not within. Uh, they still are part of that the area is still rural in character so that there's still an element of it being rural um, even if it's part of a uh, a larger community around it that that it needs to be rural not a small number of people in a larger environment hopefully that addresses your question let's see what else um I don't know if we wanted to open it up for people to ask questions verbally or if we have more questions coming in the chat. I think we've addressed most of the questions in the chat. Oh, I'm, question about merit. Yeah. Um, does somebody else want to answer that or I'm, I'm happy to dive in? Yeah, Courtney, I think that's you. OK, um, I think for merit, really what we're looking for is relevance. I, the simple way to say that is relevance to the community, um, and that would mean uh, I'll just give an example. If um, someone, you know, a group of people in a community have identified that um, they would like to uh, improve streetscape on their main street, but those people don't have connections with 
business owners on Main Street, or there's not evidence that the community itself, that the people who are directly impacted by the project are on board and engaged and that it's relevant for their personal, their, their needs as, as business people or as citizens or residents of the place. That's where that merit kind of question comes in. Is the project relevant? Is it something that there's evidence of community buy-in? Um, you know, it doesn't mean you have to have done all your community engagement, but evidence that there's demand within the community and that the opportunity to address that design challenge is relevant for more than a very small group of people who are trying to address it, um, I think would be kind of the hallmark of what we'd look for in merit. Does it have value for the community at large or for the for the community it's intended to serve? Hopefully that helps a little bit, Catherine. Um, creative placemaking, that's a big question too. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, what is the question was what would be considered creative placemaking? Um, creative placemaking is basically looking at how arts and culture can be used to address um, needs within a community, um, address problems or challenges in a community where design, arts and culture are sometimes not part of the part of the conversation. So uh, several of the things we mentioned earlier, uh, food systems, health and wellness, um, economic development. A lot of times people don't think about how arts and culture can be engaged in addressing those challenges. And the idea behind creative placemaking is that there are um, value, there's value that artists and designers can bring to those conversations that, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, that are important and can help move the needle on those challenges in a community. Um, I'm going to post a link um, in the chat real quick um, to Creative Placemaking Resources. The National Endowment for the Arts has a Creative Placemaking Grant Program called Our Town. Um, and we have tons of resources around what is what is creative placemaking um, and how um, how you can think about that in the context of community needs. And I will uh, I'll post that link momentarily. Somebody and else wants to. It's, it's grab really the next great chat. that this is a, um, a question that's being asked because some of these bigger words like um, creative placemaking or design thinking are not always familiar to um, people working at a rural or local level. Um, these are these are terms that um, are done in urban planning and design a lot. Um, and so this is why this opportunity exists, is to bring people on board and introduce these new um, ideas. But it, at the same time, it's also something that rural communities have been doing for decades. Um, you often have smaller towns where um, one person is wearing multiple hats. They are running a nonprofit. They are serving on town council. They are um, coordinating a public event. Um, and oftentimes engaging with um, artists and talking about why they love their town specifically. Um, so as long as you're talking about the and bringing pride to the place where you're living, um, that's a form of creative placemaking. And we encourage you to take advantage of this opportunity, even if that seems a little foreign or daunting to you. Looks like we also got a question um, about somebody from a small urban design and placemaking focused planning department um, asking about if the learning cohort would be an appropriate program to expand our capabilities, engage our community partners. Um, I, I think uh, yes and no. That's, I mean, that depends. Uh, I think read through the opportunity more. We also have a link to what is called the learning cohort prospectus that has more details specifically about that curriculum. I would say if you're already a design, um, a designer by training, uh, there might be some things that are redundant, but also there will be opportunities to generate new ideas for other projects that you're engaging in. Um, it might be a great opportunity to bring in board members, local funders, uh, other local nonprofits or economic development centers. Um, uh, there's definitely something that people can learn at any age or at, at any um, expertise level. Um, I would just check out that learning cohort prospectus and you can get more details about if it's something you're already familiar with. Um, uh, and if you are ready for the design workshop um, or if you are at the learning stage. So I will pull that link up and post it in the chat momentarily.
Anyone else have questions they want to submit? I think there was a question earlier about, I think maybe one on one. Um, in uh, questions, uh, you're welcome to email us um, at CIRD and I'll put this in the chat too at ruralhome.org. Evelyn, that's right, isn't it? Yep, and yes, and it's on the screen right now as well. Oh, great. Yes, right there. Um, so if you have individual questions that you um, would like to ask or want to have a quick chat with Evelyn or someone else on the team about your project, that is uh, absolutely welcome and we'd love to hear from you. Yep, and next week on Wednesday the 17th, I will be on Facebook Live answering questions for about an hour at 4 p.m. Eastern time. So follow us on Facebook and make sure you click going on that event to remind yourself to attend. And in the meantime, this uh, recording will be sent around via email through those who for those who registered and posted on rural-design.org for those who uh, didn't get the email or didn't register and would like to uh, take a listen. So please share if you know folks who might be interested. Um, Evelyn, there was a question about Facebook Live. What time? Oh, you wrote it. Great. 4 p.m. next Wednesday, East Eastern time. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us and uh, we look forward to seeing your applications. Take care. Thanks so much.